kind of having to keep a, a little bit of a hold on my spirit because my spirit just wants to kind of jump out there with all of y'all and jump on you real good. Amen. And uh, we're going to do that, I believe, before this morning is over. And um, we, um, we had an opportunity to go this past week. In fact, I've been, in, I've been a, in or a part of conferences for really the last two weeks. And it's been an awesome time just, you know, supporting, honoring, receiving, releasing, and, uh, and just being a part of the collective body of Christ. Amen? How many of you know, listen, we, we, we are one part of a much larger body. And the more faithful we are to our part, the more it begins to fit with the parts of others where t- together we become one piece in Christ. Isn't that awesome? And that's really the beautiful picture of the body. That's, you know, that's the, we, the, the expression of the body within King's Way and the expression of the body around King's Way. And there is something so fresh in the spirit. Pastor Jody spoke to this even when he was talking about what you could feel throughout the building. And, and God has really expressed himself to us and manifest himself on us in a special way these past couple days. And so one of the things that we're going to do in the name of Jesus is before we leave today, we're going to lay hands on everybody. And because uh, there's a fire, fire burning in my heart. There's a fire burning in this house. And sometimes people just need to be given permission to burn. Amen. See, sometimes your lamp could already be made ready. You could already be filled to overflow with the oil. You just need one spark to light your flame and you can stay lit for all of time. Amen. And uh, but before we jump into that, I'm going to let you know a little bit of why we're going there, how we're going there. As you can see, we've got some fill in the blank today. Hallelujah. Come on, that, that way I spend less time writing and more time talking, amen? But I really do want us to have, but to both hear and see what God is saying, because if we can hear it, if we can see it, we can become it, amen? And I think a lot of times in church, we, we hear, and listen, you can say what you hear, you can teach what you know, but you can only reproduce who you are. You can only give away what you got. And what you have is determined by the truth that you embrace, the truth that you know, the truth you become intimate with, and you begin to reproduce in your life and in the lives of those around you. And I want to tell you, listen, and you guys know this, you know my heart, but I just want to, as a reminder for you and those watching online, we're not here to just have a Sunday morning service. We're here to be the church, not just to attend it. We're here to see his kingdom come. We're here to see his will be done. We're here to see the impossible made possible, as Pastor Jeff led us in singing and declaring before. We're here to see cancer-free zones established in the earth. Amen. We're here to all of a sudden see churches that have worked against each other for many years all of a sudden begin working together under one umbrella. Amen. We're here to all of a sudden see people groups that were divided because because of racial hatred or socioeconomic jealousy or whatever it is, whatever the root is, it's all fear. Do you know the root of all division is fear? It means somebody listened to a lie and felt like that if they, that somehow they began to start having an insecurity in their life because of listening to a lie about them, about God, and about others. And somehow they thought that if they could push someone down or keep somebody back, that it would make them be lifted higher and drawn in. Lie from the pit of hell. Amen? And I don't know about you, but we're here to love the hell out of Birmingham. We're here to love the hell out of Irondale, Helena. I'm about to love some hell out of Chelsea, amen. Come on now. Nana's here as a token. We're just gonna fill her up and send her back with a double portion, amen. Listen, we're called to love the hell out of our neighbor, amen. Listen, we're not just called to be polite and passive in the expression of our Christianity. I mean, Jesus said the kingdom of the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, but the violent take it by force. And I feel a force like anointing today. I feel like in Proverbs 14, four, it says much increase comes by the strength of the ox. I feel like that God is hooking us up for the fields of harvest because he's been empowering you in this season of pruning and in this time of vision. Because one of the things about vision is vision will make you strong. Amen. It's not about just getting the vision, it's about partnering with the vision. Do this with me. Before I jump into Jeremiah 1, let's turn to Matthew 25. Jeremiah 1 is where I want to go. I saw something today that just lit my fire, hallelujah. But Matthew 25, I want to talk to you a little bit about faithfulness. I want to talk to you a little bit about stewardship. I want to talk to you a little bit about moving from your anointing to his authority. And I think I've got enough time if I talk fast enough to go both places. We may even throw in a little Hebrews 11 just to 
just to have fun with it, amen? Do want to remind you that today we are uh, beginning the second leg, uh, the last leg in the name of Jesus of our bathroom, uh, reno- not our bathroom, our restroom renovation. And so today will be the demo and then tomorrow we begin the reno. And I really think it's awesome that when the Lord called us into this season of pruning, he said it'd be a time to rest, to reset, to revive, to revamp, to relearn, to relaunch. And I think it's awesome that the renovation is the rest room. Because I think that what was the restroom is about to become the blessed room, the place where you come into rest, the place you come into trust, the place that you're willing to eliminate what's been holding you back and creating some stink in your life and the life of those around you, amen. <laughs> come on, we all do it, might as well talk about it, amen. <laughs> Listen, I wanna tell you, the place of your deliverance is the place of your freedom. And the place where you're willing to come in and let go of what you thought might have been embarrassing if somebody else saw what you were working with, I wanna tell you that restroom will become a blessed room, amen. In fact, I wanna just pray over you right now. Those of you who have been holding on to something because I believe that when the fire of God hits this place today and the Holy Spirit begins to move in the way that I know he's going to, that things are gonna come up so they can come out. Proverbs 25, four says, when the dross is removed from the silver, the silver is sent to the silversmith. It doesn't just happen upon, it doesn't just get picked up by, but it says when the dross is pulled out, the silver is sent. That is an apostolic statement. It is the sending forth. It is taking from one place to another place. When you allow what's in you to come up and come out, God says, I'll take you from where you were into the place you wanted to be. Because listen, I wanna tell you, the silversmith is not bothered by when the dross comes out of you. He gets excited. He gets excited because when it comes up, he knows it's just one motion before it comes out. And then with every bit of dross that comes up, every bit of dross that comes out, we look a little bit more like our silversmith. We look a little bit more like our Lord Jesus. We look a little bit more like what Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians 3, those who turn to the Lord that the veil could be taken away. We look a little bit more like those who have discovered liberty and freedom in the presence of the Holy Spirit. We look a little bit more like those who with unveiled faces are beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord are transformed into the image of the silversmith himself. That's what I signed up for, to look just like him, to smell like him, to talk like him, to love like him, to live like him. You know, and it's interesting, depending on the translation there in Proverbs 25, 4, it says the silver is sent to the silversmith to either be made into jewelry or a vessel. Well, jewelry, Jesus said, if I cast out devils by the finger of God, the spirit of God has come near you. And so one of the things is when you begin to recognize the things in you that need to come out, when you let go of what needs to be gone, all of a sudden God fashions you as an instrument of deliverance in the area that you were previously bound. Hebrews says you gain authority because of what you've suffered and you've overcome. But it also says in some translations that the silver sent to a silversmith to be made into a vessel. That is a vessel of honor fit for service in the courts of the king. You know what vessels are? They're containers, they're carriers. And I don't know about you, but I just see carriers of the glory, carriers of the fire. Listen, I was birthed in the flames of revival. I, this church was birthed out of the fire of revival. And see, a lot of times we can begin to look at what does it look like to be spirit-filled and service-oriented? How can we serve our city and still love the Holy Ghost? Amen. And I see a lot of churches that pick this or that, but I'm telling you in the name of Jesus, we can be both. We can be fully on fire and fully faithful at the same time, but it's been rare in the church to have a faithful body that's also on fire because a lot of on fire people get weird. You know why? Because it ain't the real fire. It's more smoke than it is flame. They might have got around some people who were on fire and they started to mimic their conduct but never saw their faith. Hebrews 13 says to remember those who rule over you, who lead you, who speak the word of God over you and imitate their faith concerning the outcome of their conduct because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I wanna tell you, when you begin to steward what God has placed in your hand in a way that honors him, in a way that is faithful to the vision that God has placed upon your life, you can enter into what Jesus called the joy of your Lord. What did Nehemiah 8 say the joy of the Lord was? Strength, right? Let's go to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, verse 14. This is the parable of the talents. We're all familiar with it. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Come on, you know, listen, you know this is a parable about Jesus and you. 
It's when Jesus takes what's his and he gives it to you. Amen. How many of you are thankful that that Jesus said in John 16 that the Holy Spirit would glorify the son? And this is how he does it. It says in verse 14 and 15, he'll take what the father has given to the son and he will give the goods to you. Exactly what the Father gave to Jesus, Holy Spirit gives to you and he gives to me when we become sons and daughters at the new birth experience. When we get filled with the Holy Spirit, when we're empowered by God to be a witness for the glory of God and for the salvation of our city, when we begin to allow souls to become a motivating force in our heart, we begin to allow transformation of the lives of others to become a guiding force and not just a better tomorrow than we had today. All of a sudden, God says, listen, I can jump all over this and be a part of what you're called to do because your heart is aligned with mine. How many of you, that's your prayer? He's giving you the goods. Say, he's giving me the goods. And to one, he gave five talents. To another, two, and to another one, uh, to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Now, God loves us all the same, but he doesn't always favor us the same. Amen? Psalm 512 says he surrounds you. He surrounds the righteous with favor like a shield. But right here, he says, the goods you get is based on the ability to steward. Romans 12, 3 says we each have been given a measure of faith that's in proportion to the gift that we're called to carry. See, that measure of faith is not saving faith. The church has preached that wrong for so many years. Romans chapter 12 is all about the motivational gifts that are to serve the body to where we could really become the expression of Christ in the earth. It talks about the gift of leadership, the gift of prophecy, the gift of mercy, the gift of giving and generosity, on and on, the gift of exhortation. And I want to tell you, God has given you all that you need to become all that you're called to be. He has given you a unique measure of faith that is intimately connected with the unique grace and gift that he has placed upon your life. Now, your faith won't look like my faith. My faith won't look like your faith because your gift doesn't look like my gift and my grace doesn't look like yours. Amen? That's why there's different parts in the wall and different members in the body. Amen? Listen, if we were a a, a 20-fingered hand, that would just be weird and unproductive. And a lot of things aren't functioning in the church because we're overloading a certain member. We're over-pursuing a certain function instead of recognizing, God, what have you placed in my heart? I want to tell you, your vision is connected to to what you love, and what you love is connected to your vision. You don't have to look hard. Look at what moves your heart. Look at what moves your heart. Look at what breaks your heart. Look at what brings joy to your heart. And right there in the middle is what God has called you to be the solution to. You're not, listen, a lot of times we see somebody else's vision and maybe that feels a little bit more spiritual than what our vision is. Maybe you're, listen, maybe you're teaching kindergarten and you see this other person who's, who's preaching crusades in Africa and somehow you think that them preaching crusades in Africa is more spiritual than you teaching kids in kindergarten. It's not. It's not not. Success is measured by faithfulness where God has planted you. Because, hey, guess what? You could be teaching a room full of the next crusade ministers. You could, be, you could all of a sudden touch the next Billy Graham. You could all of a sudden touch the next, uh, or not the next, but the soon-to-be years down the road once they're 35 United States president. Hallelujah. You never know the impact you have when you choose to be faithful where you're at. The grass is not greener on the other side. It is greener where you are faithful to water it and use yesterday's crap as today's fertilizer for tomorrow's harvest. Hallelujah. Gotta love some manure. Verse 16. I've been living in this back to the future thing. I was all of a sudden seeing Biff get filled up with that truck of poop. Then he... Then he, who had received, then he, how many he's and she's and we's out there? Come on, he's talking to you. He's giving out goods. Who wants them? Listen, what you do with what you have determines what you receive. Jesus said to him who has, more will be given, but to him who does not have, what he has will be taken from him. How do you take something from someone who has nothing when what they have has them or they can't see what they have in the first place because they're so busy looking at the havings of others? Amen. Listen, if you, if, you, if you can't tell, I'm a little fired up. Lord woke me up at 144 this morning, and it wasn't like I had to pee. It was like, 
yes, Lord, I'm here. I'm listening. It was holy. It was holy. And I had just gone to bed a few minutes earlier. And I said, well, maybe I need to go back so I can be strong for tomorrow. And I, for a second, I just tried to close my eyes. And you ever try to close your eyes out here, but they're wide awake in there? I said, yes, sir. So I just came and sat before him, laid with him, listened to him, talked to him, dreamed with him. And I'm telling you, listen, for those who are willing to arise, he will cause you to shine. But you can't allow the shade of those around you to keep you from shining. Don't let them put their shade on your shine. Listen, I'm fast on social media, but if I wasn't, I'd tweet that. Don't let the world... Don't let darkness put its shade on your shine. Don't di- listen, don't dim who you are because of who they're not. Then he, she, we, who had received the five talents, went and traded with them and made another five talents. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I lo- listen, I love that he's not a passive Jesus. I love he's a joyful Jesus, but he's also a Jesus that has a get it done spirit on him, amen? Now listen, you can get more done often in your rest than in your striving, but sometimes, sometimes you just gotta use what you got and you gotta put it in the field, amen? And so it says that he went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also, but he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. You ever thought you were doing something smart and you found out it was really dumb? Aaron and I were talking about this passage the other night and and I said, well, you know what it means to to, to, to be given five and and, and to see it become five more? It's when you take what God has given to you and you find five other people to give it to. What he's talking about is not just going and trading in the stock market. This is not about wealth. This is about gifts. This is about when you begin to take what God has given to you and you begin to impart it to others. When you begin to faithfully steward the gifts and the grace and the seed that God has placed in your heart, the incorruptible seed by which we are born again by. And you find five other people, 10 other people, 15, because that's what I'm gonna tell you. If you're, if you're faithful at five, God will give you 50. If you're faithful at 50, God will give you 500. If you're faithful at 500, 500 become 5,000. If you're faithful at 5,000, 5,000 become 50,000. And this is how the whole earth is filled with the knowledge of God's glory but we're sitting on it. We're sitting on it. We may throw it on our Facebook status, but I want to tell you, your Facebook status ain't changing the world. If that hurt, good. Good. Turn the cheek, I'll give you another. (laughs) You got to get out and make a difference in people's lives. We're not here to convince them to think like us. We're here to love them like he loves us. It ain't about what they, it ain't, it ain't about getting them to use our language. It's about getting them to receive his love. Amen. And so you got to give away what he's given to you. Give it away, give it away, give it away now. Come on. A little red hot chili peppers, hallelujah. <laughs> After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And I want to tell you, listen, this is going to happen. I don't have time to get into it today because bless God, we got to get to Jeremiah and I got some blanks to fill in. But there is a day that is going to come in your life and in mine to where God is, we're going to stand before God and he's going to listen. Those who have accepted Christ as their Lord, they're going to come right through the judgment seat of Christ. They're going to be ushered into heaven. But I want to tell you, on the way there, he's also going to judge the works that we did here on earth, whether they good, bad, and he's going to begin to inspect the fruit of our life. Amen. See, we're not called to inspect fruit. We're called to water trees, but he will inspect the fruit. And he said that he has rewards for those who have walked in the good works the good works. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's workmanship. We are his poema. We are his masterpiece created for what? Good works prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. Amen. Paul is the apostle of grace. And there's a misapplication of grace that you don't have to do. You don't need to do. You better do. Paul is the apostle of grace. Say, listen, 
The world is going to hell if we don't do what we're called to do. Hell is a real place. Heaven is a real place. And it's up to us to get those who are headed for hell headed toward heaven. And the way that we do that is through walking in the good works that Christ has prepared for you and me. The way that we do that is to begin to know us the way that he knows us to begin to step into what he's ordained us to be, to not sit on the talent, the gift, the grace, and the abilities that God has given to us, but say, God, listen, I'm so thankful. If it looks like a little, give it to a lot, and it'll become more. He who is faithful with what? Little, it'll become much. Listen, don't expect to get much right out of the gate. What you have with what looks little, all of a sudden, God will begin to multiply over time. Listen, I'm loving how God is answering prayer right now. How many, of you, how many of you, God, has just been just ratcheting up the answers to the prayers you pray? It's amazing. And we're in this time as a staff, too, in this 40-day fast where we're fasting different elements of distraction and, and really getting our eyes single across the board in every way. If there's anything that is keeping our heart from being fully committed or devoted to him, anything that would distract when we could be giving him our full attention, cut it off. It's a branch that doesn't produce fruit. I want intimacy, not entertainment. Amen? And what we see there is we see that there is a call to rightly reveal Christ to the world around us. We see that if we can begin to pray radical prayers, and I want to tell you, listen, some of the prayers that you need to pray need to be immediate prayers. I'm praying prayers that have to do with the next three, four, five years and longer, but I also prayed some prayers last week that had to be answered last week, and they were. I was praying for some relational restoration in some areas where the enemy had got in and began to try to root out and pull down wrong things that should have already been built and planned. And I want to encourage you in your prayer life, pray pray small prayers with short deadlines and pray large prayers with long deadlines. Have a great mixture of it because guess what? If you always pray about tomorrow and you never pray about today, you may be discouraged in your prayer life. I like how Bill Johnson said, he said he prays in three different categories. He prays for things that will happen regardless of his prayers, just so he can stay encouraged. So he's got something to give God the glory for. He prays about the impossible and he prays about the things that are likely to happen with a little bit of God's grace and some of his effort coupled with it. Amen? And see, a lot of times we don't see the answers to the prayers we're praying because we don't write them down. We don't keep them. We're not consistent. We're not praying through. We think if we pray a second time, it's a lack of faith. It's not. It's not. When you begin to just lock in to what God has given you in your heart, and you say, listen, I'm going to pray this thing through to completion. Listen, that honors God because guess what? Those prayers honor God and God honors those prayers because it puts all of your eggs in his basket. Amen? And so Jesus here is speaking to these guys who have their own eggs, their own gifts, their own grace. And it says in verse 20, he says, so he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look! I've gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Amen. So faithfulness will actually bring you into strength according to Jesus and Nehemiah. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He goes on to say, verse 22, he also, he, he also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Now listen, Luke 19 also has a similar passage, but in that passage, there's three servants here. There's 10 servants there. And that passage, they're giving out minas, which is about three months salary. Here they're giving out 20, ta- here they're giving out talents, which is 20 years salary. Favor ain't fair. But what you do with what you have determines how much more God can give to you. What you're willing to allow him to move through you, God will get more to you. Amen? One of the things that I love in Luke 19, even though it's a smaller portion, it's a bigger reward. Because those who are faithful in Luke 19 with the minas, he doesn't just give more minas, he gives authority over cities. What you do with what you've got determines not only what God is able to entrust to you, but also the place of promotion he can lift you up into. 
You see, if your vision is from God, your anointing is necessary, but his authority is needed. Without his influence, your vision will not have impact. And until we're, until we're faithful in what looks little and insignificant in the moment, until we're faithful with the one in front of us that we could easily walk by, until we're faithful with that little bit of a paycheck that we have right now, God can't trust us with the millions he wants to bring to us and through us. What, what is it that you can begin to start doing now in small measure that begins to start moving you down the timeline of destiny toward the vision that God has for you? You begin to start recognizing that now and get faithful where you're at and watch how quickly the dross comes up and your silver is apostolically sent to the silversmith to become something you never thought you could be. What I'm doing today, listen, I was, I was before I was born, this is who God called me. Before I was born, my parents had an encounter, my dad had an angelic encounter where it was, it was prophesied to him what I was gonna do and who I was gonna be. And guess what? This is very small compared to the bigness of where we're all gonna be. This is a step, but it is very small. I am not easily impressed. But I do feel the weight of responsibility for each and every one of us to be faithful where we're at. Amen? And as we recognize that no matter how big of an opportunity you're looking at right now in your life, it is very, very small in terms of the greatness of where God ultimately wants you to go. It'll cause you to steward that, not as, oh, I could do this or I could do that, but it will cause you to steward in the fear of the Lord. And when you begin to steward in the fear of the Lord, everything you do becomes worship and even the mundane things matter. And that's the beauty of vision. It pulls it all together in one beautiful picture. Verse 24, then he who had received, then he who had received that one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And see, I want to tell you, the root of misstewarding what God has is a lack of knowledge of God. Moses. Moses. He's leading out the Israelites. I mean, he is God's man of power for the hour. You know, it says that he was excellent in word and speech until God spoke and then he began to stutter. And all of a sudden, what happens is all of a sudden when God picks you as his mouthpiece, don't be surprised if you see some sort of disability that tells you you can't. But I want to tell you, if a bush is talking to you, you, you certainly can talk to a pharaoh. If you got a donkey talking to you, you oh, I better back up. I'm about to go King James. A lack of knowledge of God, not knowing God. Moses in Exodus 33, he's, le he's led the people out. He's in the wilderness. He's seen God provide through quail. He's seen water come out of rocks. He's gone up to the mountain. He's encountered the glory. He got so much of the glory on him that people were asking him to wear a shade. Never let them put their shade on your shine. Maybe if he had kept the veil off, they would have never had that golden calf in the first place. Because see, what they needed is they needed an encounter with an unveiled face. And if they were veiled, he could have pulled his back. Don't allow what you feel like people don't want from God through you in their life keep you veiled when you're called to live unveiled to the world around you. Take it off. In fact, right now, why don't you just allow the Lord to demask you? Why, listen, you may have come in here, you may have come in here like a Saul, and listen, you may call yourself a Christian, but you're criticizing the body, which makes you a Saul because you're persecuting the Lord's body. But if you can allow him to demask you like he demasked Paul, Saul, then Paul on the road to demask us, then he could collectively demask us. He could take us off the high horse of pride, put us on the face of humility, and all of a sudden call an unknown somebody who's only mentioned once in the scripture who has one vision, one vision, one vision, one vision in his house. Nobody knows him. We never hear about him again. He has one vision that he's faithful to. Go to the street called straight, which also can be translated abundance. I'm just gonna let that walk around. Go to the street called Straight. You're going to find a guy named Saul. Lay hands on him. The scales are going to fall from his eyes. He's going to begin to see. He's going to become hungry where he thought he was full because he was full of a religious thing and he's going to become hungry for the real thing. 
He's going to become thirsty. And listen, you're going to go prophesy to him about all the things he's going to suffer for my namesake, and that will mess up your Western world Christianity. Listen, these present sufferings are nothing compared to eternal glory that will be revealed in us. And I don't know about you, but if there's eternal glory on the other side of a little suffering, sign me up for some suffering. I'll take it. I'll take it, because guess what? I know there's a joy set on the other side. Amen? I was planning to talk about Jezebel today. We'll see where we get. Because I'm seeing in the spirit some of the similar tactics of the enemy that are trying to rise up in people's fields in wrong ways. And I want to tell you, listen, if you're not sold out, if you're not committed to what he's called to do, listen, if you're not willing to die for something, you'll never really live for anything. And too often we're being taken out by lesser loves because we've never experienced real love for ourselves. We lived on some sort of third world Christianity by somebody else's podcast or somebody else's pulpit. And we never came into the knowledge. We never knew him for who he really was. And because we never knew him for who he really was, we were scared to give what he really gave to us. And this poor guy, he got read the riot act. He got thrown into the outer court, weeping and gnashing of teeth. We don't have time to go there and you might, it might not encourage you, so flip over to Jeremiah 1. But if you're sitting on it, you better get on it. He says, listen, you could have at least given it to somebody else like a banker so I could have collected some interest. God is all about the return. God is all about the return on his investment. He is a wise investor. And he gave the best seed he could ever give, his son. And guess what? He, gave the, he found the best soil that he could ever find, you and me. But the problem is, is sometimes he can be more committed to our promise and our progress than we are. And see, until we see ourselves as he sees us, we can't live as he lives in us. Jeremiah chapter one, let's move quickly. Verse four. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Man, I'm still stuck on this Ananias deal. He had one vision, y'all. One vision. Right. Y'all know about Ananias? Does anybody not know about Ananias? Anybody? Hallelujah. One vision. And he begins to argue with it. He enters into self-preservation. He has a vision from God. He sees a clear picture. God begins to speak. Listen, go to this place, lay hands on the guy that came to your city to kill you. How many of you would have called a friend to see if it bore witness with them or possibly thrown it on Facebook to see how many likes you got before you actually committed to what he said to do? Listen, most of what God is speaking to you belongs in your journal, not on somebody else's journey. Because you're serving up half-baked cupcakes that sound like exhortation and they're actually admonition. God is actually coming to correct you. He's not coming to direct you because until you begin to receive the correction that comes, you actually don't have a pulpit to begin to direct others. Wow. Wow. I'm fasting Facebook and so Instagram, so you can say whatever you want about me on there. I don't care. I'm not going to see it. I told Tina the other day, I was like, this is amazing. This is amazing because guess what? You can see stuff on Facebook that may be talking about you and it may not be talking about you, but guess what? When you see it, the devil says, they're talking about you. When you don't see it, ignorance really is bliss. <laughs> Jeremiah 1. Man, y'all go study Ananias. Listen, if we could just raise up an Ananias. There is a Saul out there somewhere doing something who's, who's just, listen, his destiny is connected to one person who can be faithful to one vision and be happy to never be heard from again. How many of us would be willing to be that Ananias? Without Ananias... Two-thirds of the New Testament would have been written. All kinds of churches would have been planted. We, we, we wouldn't have what we have today in terms of understanding about what New Covenant, New Testament community and church is meant to look like. We wouldn't even have a list of the fruit of the Spirit. We'd probably be putting things like suspicion on there. Offense. Fruit of the raisin. The word of the Lord came to me saying... Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. 
Now, let me, just, let me just speak this to you because I want to tell you, before he formed you in the womb, not only did he know you, but it says that he sanctified you. You know what the word sanctify means? Set aside. He set you apart. Before you were in the womb, he said, Richard Reeder's mine. Josh Kosker's mine. Beth Kosker's mine. James Yates, Kayla, David, you're mine. You're mine. You're mine. He set you apart. He handpicked you. Isn't that awesome? He reached down and said, you know, he didn't just pick you individually. He said, you know what? I need some D-rings in my life. And he ordered your steps in such a way before you're even in the womb so that God would order your steps in a way that only he could. So not only that you could be you and you could be you, but y'all could be y'all. That's amazing. You know why? Because from the foundations of the earth, you were called to be one. One flesh. He formed you. He knew you. And my question for you, my question for me, and my question for us is do we know us the way that he knows us? Does he, do we know us the way that he knows us? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I ordained you. The word ordained there means I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God has set you apart and he has appointed you. And when you begin to find, when you begin to identify his appointing in your life, his appointment in your life, all of a sudden you begin to partner with his anointing in your life. And it's the vision that God has for you. Vision, again, is most often revealed in the thing that you love most. And what you love most often reveals your vision. It could be teaching kindergarten in a school that nobody's ever heard about. And maybe the next Ananias is in your class and you're the person who helps them to begin to recognize the voice of the Lord in their own hard time. Then I said, oh Lord, I, I, I can't. Behold, I cannot speak for I'm a youth. Nobody's gonna listen to me. Nobody's gonna listen to me. I don't have anything to give. These are the lies that come, aren't they? But the Lord said to me, don't give me an excuse, son. Don't tell me you can't shine at your school. Don't tell me that you can't be the difference. Don't tell me that you can't be the answer to a generation of prayers prayed in your city. Because I want to tell you, God answers the prayers of people through people of prayer. And what's been happening this time of pruning and this call to prayer is as we're beginning to give ourselves and our hearts to a new level of intimacy and prayer in the Lord, prayers of people in the past are being answered in a present way by a people of prayer. Because all of a sudden you begin to recognize that for such a time as this, this day answer to the prayers that they have prayed. <laughs> Do not say I am a youth. For you shall go to all to whom I send you. That's just you will do what I created you to do. You will walk in the good works that I prepared before the foundations of the earth. The workmanship, how I, I formed you for a purpose. You see, you're appointed and anointed for a purpose. When the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we're given power to be a witness. Isaiah 61, it talks about, I've been anointed, and it talks about the functions and the byproducts of the anointing on our life. You are anointed and appointed for a purpose. And I want to tell you, the first purpose that you were ordained for was in Mark chapter 3, verse 13. It said that he called to himself those he himself wanted, that they might be with him. And from there, he said to preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast the devils, raise the dead. What was it said of Peter and John when they reached out to that lame man? They said, they're not smart boys, but they've been with Jesus. It said he called to himself those he himself wanted that they might. It didn't say that they would be with him because the choice is ours. And see, what happens when we begin to respond to his calling in our life to be with him, guess what? We become like him. We can't represent him. We can't reveal the father if we don't spend time with him and see the father. It's, a, it's, it's so crazy. We can't live. I mean, we're going to say it. It's going to sound crazy, but then you're going to be like, oh, crap. I've thought that before. 
How crazy is it to think we can live the Christian life without a daily life with Christ? We think that praying a prayer one day all of a sudden means that we're going we're gonna to just live this amazing Christian life. I want to tell you, daily you take up your cross. Daily you remind yourself that it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. My life, your life, our life has been bought with a price. And it is a privilege to lay down our life for him. It is a privilege to say yes to him. I heard a speaker say something this week and I liked it. He said, boldness is not a personality type. It's a yes and a heart. He said, sometimes people say, well, I'm not bold. I'm, I'm just kind of an introvert. You listen, there's introverts and extroverts and both can be anointed with boldness because the righteous are. And so if you're not bold, it's because you believe the lie that has caused you to see yourself as unrighteous. Boldness is not a personality type. It's not, it has nothing to do with caffeine. <laughs> Listen, you may be a decaf person, but you can have a caffeinated call. Woo, <laughs> man. I like that. Mm. Do not say I'm a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you shall speak. He was called to be a prophet. What are you called to do? He said, you're going to do what I created you to do, and you're going to like it. Because there's nothing more fulfilling than, than, than living up to our call. You don't go without, listen, it might look like sacrifice in the beginning because the truth is you're letting go of things that have had a hold on you. And what you're letting go of, your flesh may have catered to in times past, but there's nothing as free as when your spirit begins to soar with him in the high place. And when your spirit begins to soar with him, you'll begin to recognize the things that had held onto your flesh in times past. This world had nothing for you but you've got everything for this world. And in that place, you don't love the things of the world, but you begin to lay down your life and love the world. At the 11 o'clock service, I was trying to do it at the nine o'clock. I don't have time now, but I want to talk about, do you know him? Do you, do you know you the way that he knows you? Do you know you the way that he knows you? You see, because vision, your vision, vision fulfilled actually defines to the world who he created you to be. Your vision fulfilled, your vision clearly mapped out, clearly communicated with and partnered with on a daily basis communicates to the world who he created you to be. I decided to wear some props today. You'll see on my feet, I got me some Jordans, hallelujah. Oh, I can't help it, they're on fire. Now, you see that jump man sign, what does that mean? Basketball, Jordan, best player ever. I'm sorry, LeBron. Guess what? God did not create him to play baseball in Birmingham. That was not his high call. That was a low call. I would never sign up for a team called Barron, but anyway, that's a whole other deal. He's a good golfer. That's a medium call, but his high call is basketball. Now, if you well, I won't go into the hallelujah. Not all calls look sacred from your perspective. But when you walk into your high calling, it actually becomes a form of worship. Now, ultimately, Jesus has the responsibility to get a hold of their heart to where they can sanctify his gift to bring honor to his name. It doesn't mean that everybody that's walking in a level of God-given gift is honoring God in the process. But it's our job to pray for them that they would. Proverbs 21.1 says that God holds the 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 the, the hearts of kings in his hand. Turns it whichever way he wishes, just like the river. What if we had done more praying for tiger than clapping for tiger? Woods, not the poo guy. <laughs> Instead of golf clapping some accomplishments, what if we began to start interceding? I guarantee he wouldn't have gotten in the mess he got into. See, we allowed entertainment to take the place of intimacy. We allowed culture to take the place of call. William Seymour. William Seymour. You know, there was, a, um, there was a revival, a great revival that was aborted because the leader of the revival listened to the wrong person. Welsh revival never had to end. In fact, Evan Roberts was probably one of the most surrendered and submitted ears to the voice of God in his generation. But he had this other person get in his life who was a Jezebel. 
And she began to suggest things to his heart that brought him into a place where he began to question his call, question his fruit, and if he really knew the voice of God in the first place. And guess what? If somebody had been bold enough in his day to kick down that door, punch her in the face, I said it, spiritually, 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 spiritually. <laughs> Jeff, get the duct tape and the rope. We going in there, Bubba. We'll put some ice on it, but we got to get him out. Y'all got offended. That's all right. Because <laughs> listen, when you're, when, you're, when you're messing with the spirit, you can't be polite. I'm not talking about creating physical harm, but I'm saying the devil don't play fair, so why do you? If he's a cheat, why do you play by his rules? Why do you do what he says when he's called to do what you say? Isn't he supposed to be our footstool? I don't know about you, but I pull that footstool into my feet. That footstool doesn't tell me what to do, where to go, when to be there. Oh, we got a footstool on our porch. I love that footstool. That was a great purchase. You're amazing. But guess what? That footstool serves me. I don't serve it. How often do we find ourselves serving a fallen angel who gave up who he was called to be and in serving him, we give up who we're called to be? If somebody had been strong enough in Evan Roberts' day to kick down that door and say, come on, Evan, quit listening to her. She's a jazzy. You got to you surround yourself with people who recognize the enemy's devices in your life, who can recognize spiritual strongholds so when they show up and they try to walk in your office, the next office ever goes, I hope you smelled what I smelled. I'm like, I smell it. <laughs> we got a keen sense of smell for that spirit. You know why? Because we've had to confront it. We've had to deal with it. It tried to get in and we had to get it out. A couple times. You know why? Jezebel always goes after the head of the prophets because the prophets are called to be a voice. And if she takes out your head, she can rob you of your voice. And if she robs you of the voice, she robs Jesus of the way in the wilderness that needs to be prepared for his coming. Evan Roberts got taken out by a... Oh my gosh, I'm out of time. I haven't even got to my blanks. There's a whole other side. The Welsh revival didn't have to end, but guess what? God always has a plan. Even in our weakness, he is strong. And so Evan got taken out by this Jezebel. But guess what? Before he got taken out, he was writing letters to LA. He was writing letters to small groups of prayer that were praying and believing for revival to break out. And God, so let me do this. We'll come back to here. See, people lose their way when they lose their why. And there's a lot of people in the church during that time that have lost their why. But God had this one man who they couldn't kill. Smallpox tried to take him out. His face was deformed, so he grew a beard. So I'll pit it up. So he grew a beard to cover his scars. Lost eyesight in his left eye, and God still called him, will he see more? He was the son of slaves. He had every reason not to believe big, to dream big, to pray hard, and to think long into the next generation. But he refused to allow rejection to become an obstacle. And I want to tell you, if you respond to rejection rightly, it'll become a catalyst that will launch you well beyond those who reject you because the truth is you didn't need their approval in the first place. And so there's this guy named Charles Parham and bless God, Charles Parham was teaching the, teaching the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And how, let, me know, let me tell you, listen, God's gifts aren't necessarily character-based. Romans eleven twenty nine says the gifts and callings of God are irrevo irrevocable, right? He gives gifts and there are many a people that their character does not line up with their gift. And see, not only was Charles Parham in a place where he had some things in his heart that really didn't line up with the heart of our God. He was a segregationist. He was a separatist. He believed that people of different skin color could not worship together. They could not drink from the same water. He, you wonder how 
Somebody like that could get the Holy Ghost and this sweet guy William Seymour couldn't. Well, because God will use the foolish things to confound the wise and God doesn't do it our way, he does it his way and God always has a better plan because if God had just given it to William Seymour where he was at, he would have never got to LA. He would have never entered in as a person of prayer into the prayers of Frank Bartleman and he would have never had somebody to run with him as the fire of God began to spread. See, a lot of times we think it would have been easier but it wouldn't have been right. And so Charles Parham even though he, he, he was trying to keep Willie out, he still kind of was like, I know this is wrong. I'm going to do the best I can. I'm just going to leave the door open. You can sit outside and we'll just pretend like I didn't even know. He was, because he was living in a day where he was allowing the day to dictate his way instead of his way to dictate his day. And how many of us do the same thing? How many of us allow what's said on the news to dictate our relationships in the church? Oh man, I'm already out of time. I might as well go there. He allowed the misjustice of his time to keep him in a wrong place. And God even used that to light a fire in William to where William began to believe beyond his current level of experience and he began to take a talent of revelation that he had. He did not yet have the talent. We talk parable of talents. He began to take what God gave him in his heart that he did not yet have in his hand or his mouth. And he simply committed to begin to give away what he had. And so all of a sudden, all these students in Charles Parham School, right? All these students in Charles Parham School. And guess who the first one is that gets an invitation to go and to impart this thing called the baptism of the Holy Ghost? William Seymour. It wasn't all the white kids inside the class. It was the African-American man that made sit outside on the steps. I love my Jesus. I love my Jesus. You see, he could have said like Jeremiah, I can't. Jeremiah was a youth. William was black and blind. He was one up on Jeremiah. Jeremiah was going to get older. William was going to stay black. And probably blind, unless he got healed. You can't allow what you've adopted as a disability in the eyes of others keep you from the privilege of prayer and presence that you're called to carry. Can't allow how others see you. Can't allow how others see you keep you from seeing yourself as he knows you, as he knows you. Jeremiah said, before he formed me in the womb, I knew you. He brings Jeremiah through this whole process. He says, I've put my words in your mouth. See, I've set you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms. He stretched forth his hand. He touched his mouth. He said, listen, I've anointed you and appointed you to root out, to pull down, to destroy, and to throw down, to build, and to plant. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you? And see, what you see is your vision. What do you see? Where do you see you? Do you see yourself as he sees you? Do you know yourself as he knows you? Do you know yourself as the set apart, the appointed and the anointed of God? See, Noah saw a ark. Abraham saw a son and a city. Hebrews 11. We don't have time to go there. I had planned to. But, but guess what? When Noah saw an ark, he picked up a hammer. When you see something God-given, you begin to take action. When Abraham saw a son, he picked up something else. <laughs> not only did he conceive a son in his old age with a woman, we talked about that last week, not everybody, not every person understands their part in the process of your promise, right? We talked about Sarai last week. Sarai had the bright idea going, hey, why don't you lay with Hagar? I can't give you what God wants to give, but maybe she can. Not everybody understands the part they play in the process of your promise, but you better. Then all of a sudden, Hagar gets pregnant. Sarai gets pissed because honestly, misery loves company. I think Sarai was hoping Hagar would be barren too because she'd feel a whole lot better about who she wasn't and what she couldn't do. I'm just going to let that walk. Not only did he have a son, but in Hebrews 11, verse 8, it says that he was, he was believing for a city whose builder and maker was God. 
Sounds like Birmingham to me, man. I mean, the first time I drove through this city, before we ever had a yes in our heart to what God had, we had no idea. We thought we were driving through to see our friend Jake Hamilton to hang out for a couple days, have dinner, whatever. And I told Tina, I said, I feel like the lay, I feel like I found the home I never knew I had. I found a city who, at least for me, the builder and maker is God. You see, Ezra saw the temple. Nehemiah saw a wall. What do you see? I feel like God is just singing over you. Do you see what I see? Do you know you the way that I know you? Because if you don't know you the way that he knows you, you'll begin to live committed to another person's call. You'll miss out on what God has for you to do. And in that place, all of a sudden, you find yourself seeing something bigger than what you can produce in your own strength. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves asking God, how? And I want to tell you, God asks us, who? Nineteen hundred, nineteen o four, nineteen o five, nineteen o six. The world was asking how. When it looked like the Welsh revival was dying, the church was saying how. God wasn't concerned with the how. He had the how. He was just looking for somebody willing to be the who. We ask God how. He asks us who. Because if we'll give him our who, he'll give us his how. And you might be the next Ananias. You might be the next Jeremiah. You might be the next William Seymour, or you might just be the next Morgan Reeves. You might be the next Reagan Salter. You might be the next Gail Chavez. You might be the next Jonathan Newman, Tim Beck, Shelley Reader, Richard Reader, Josh Cosker, Michael French. Do you see what he sees? Do you know you the way that he knows you? Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, and I don't have time to get the prophetic significance of that, maybe the 11 o'clock, I've got a whole different message to the 11. At the 11, we're going to talk about the impartation of vision. The 9 o'clock, we're talking about igniting vision because I believe that God's about to ignite something. I feel like a powder keg. Just listen, I'm, I, just one spark in this place could go up. Just one spark, one spark of the right flame and people who are willing to commit to it and not let go. Because I'm telling you, it's not just about a call, it's about being consistent in what God has called us to do. What do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you've seen well, Jeremiah, for I'm ready to perform my word. It actually sounds like he saw wrong. I saw an almond tree. Good, you saw it well. I'm watching over my word to perform it. Why? Of course, there's a play on words. God always speaks to you in your language. He spoke to Jeremiah. He, he spoke something that Jeremiah was not able to hear, see, or understand because I hadn't seen it, ear hadn't heard it, it had not yet entered the hearts of man, but it was revealed to him by the Spirit in something he could see, hear, and understand, an almond branch. And we know, of course, the Hebrew, there was a comparison between the word sheked and shakad. And so he showed him something he knew to bring him into the understanding of something he had never seen before. And oftentimes, when it comes to your vision, it comes to your call, it can look very natural in the beginning. And then all of a sudden, God pulls you in. For me, it was fire boots. Y'all remember that story? They looked very natural. And for some, well, I know, I know y'all are hating on my fire boots. I know that. But I didn't care because it meant something to me. I knew that people thought it was dumb that I wore those, but guess what? When I put them on, It made something in me come alive. Not because of a bike, it was because of a faith, it was a belief. And you can't judge what you put on and what you take off based by what others are gonna think and what they're gonna say. Bless God, if it's your fit, put it on. Put it on. 
Put off the spirit of heaviness and put on the garment of praise. Put on what God created you for. Come on as his workmanship and begin to put on the good works that were prepared for you beforehand. Put on the good works that Jesus said in Matthew 5 would cause the world around us to give glory to our Father in heaven. Verse 17, I'm gonna just these last two verses and then we're gonna pray for everybody. You guys good? All right, I'm holding back a lot right now, hallelujah. Verse 17, so Jesus says, here's who you are, what do you see? And then he gives him, a, he gives him an action step. Therefore, prepare yourself and arise. Prepare yourself and take action and speak to, prepare yourself and arise and speak to them all that I command you. He was called to be a prophet. He was called to speak. What are you called to do? Arise and walk in the good works that God has prepared before you. Arise and be faithful where you're at. Don't buy time where you're at until you get to where you want to be. Guess what? You're exactly where you're supposed to be and being faithful in your now is the key to your next. That's how it works. Glory to glory. Do not be dismayed before their faces or Facebook. Lest I dismay you before them. And this is what I saw today that made my heart jump up and down for you. Because I believe that he is saying this to you, Kingsway. I believe he's saying this to you, Margaret. I believe he's saying this to you, Laura Beth. I believe he's saying this to you, Nick, Rachel, Matt, Sarah. I believe he's saying this to every one of you and us together. For behold, I have made you this day. I have made you this day a fortified city and an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land and against the kings of Judah, against his princes, against priests, and against the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. I'm going to deliver you from them, but I'm also going to bring you into where I want you to be, and if you won't quit along the way, you're going to make a way for others where there seems to be no way, because the way himself, the truth himself, the life himself has put you on. He's put me on like a glove, and bless God, he's worthy of our sacrifice. He's worthy of our obedience. Let's go ahead and stand to your feet, and then I'll try to quit talking so we can lay hands on everybody. But this is what this is what really stuck out to me. I've made you this day. And honestly, when I read that this morning, a little after two in the morning, I don't know if I was just delirious for not sleeping for two weeks with conferences and all kinds of other stuff. But honestly, my heart's so on fire. It's so awake right now. It was like the Lord slipped a word into my heart when I was reading it on the page because this is how I read it. For behold, I have made you for this day. I have made you for this day, Kingsway. I've made you for this day. God saw before the foundations of the earth, 2018, and he knew exactly what Birmingham needed, Irondale needed, and wherever you're from. And he formed you, he knew you, he set you apart, he appointed you, and he anointed you for this day. And my question for you is will you know him as he knows you? And are you willing to become all that he created you to be? Are you willing to do all that he created you to do? And are you willing to walk in the boldness today of your yes and your heart to him? Huh? Come on, if that's you, here's what we're gonna do very quickly, because I did, I went way over time and I, I, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. We're gonna come forward, we're gonna minister to the Lord in a second in our giving, okay? Instead of having our typical ministry teams up here, I'm gonna ask for the ministry team, once you come and you give your offering to come over here and get in line first, Tina and I are gonna pray for you, release what God has put on us. And this is gonna build into the next service too. I can, I can feel it just beginning to burn this fire. And once we lay hands on you, however God touches you, allow yourself to be touched. We've got plenty of ushers and catchers. But once you either get back up or you begin to receive prayer and begin to join in, I'm gonna ask those who are on ministry teams at this service to come behind Tina and I and you're gonna to help to soak those who are already being prayed for, amen? 
They come behind and continue to pray. But here's the thing is, we're praying His way, not ours. We're praying His will and not ours. We're not praying our understanding, we're praying His wisdom, amen? And so what we're gonna do, we're gonna line everybody up. Once you get prayer, if you have kids and king's kids, I'm gonna ask you, you go get them. So be respectful to the workers and switch out our teachers before the 11 o'clock service begins. But go ahead and just take your offering in your hand. Jesus said in Luke 6, 38, give and it'll be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will men pour into your bosom. With the same measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. And here's what I want you to do. What you're giving to God right now, your natural becomes supernatural when you give it to Him. Your fish becomes enough for 5,000 when you give it to Him. But I want to tell you, listen, I don't believe it's about a coming day that God pours back into your bosom. I believe that God is challenging us even today to do something radical in the area of, of faithfully stewarding the talents, the gifts, the money, the resources we have to say, God, I want what He's talking about more than what I've got at home. I want what's available to me and not what I've known up until now. And God may say, rip up the check you wrote before and write a new one. Put a demand on the anointing. Put a demand on what God has promised you to do. Because I'm telling you, listen, your vision is not limited by your current provision. When you begin to partner with his vision, he begins to release his provision to bring your vision to pass. And so you need to hear God. You need to hear God. This is not just a regular tithe or offering. This is a saying, God, I want something that I don't have and I'm willing to give what I do have that you could pour back into me. Amen? Go ahead and just stretch your hands to heaven. I'm going to pray for you and then we'll line you up. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this house. And God, I thank you that you made us for this day. You made us for this day. Not tomorrow, not yesterday, but this day. And we will be an Arise and Shine people. God, as we give to you, we thank you that you give back to us. But God, we want something supernatural more than our natural. We want your oil more than our toil. And so Father, I ask for a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a great outpouring of the anointing, a great outpouring of authority in the area of our faithfulness that we would become supernaturally fruitful. In Jesus' name, come on down.